สวัสดีครับ Hello and welcome to Daily Wisdom: Walking the Path with the Buddha. Today we're in our retreat series, which is titled Harmony in Relationships. I'm teaching you guys several classes that are taught that were taught in the retreat that I did this summer in the USA. This summer in the USA, I taught a five-day retreat where, for about two and a half days, I taught various. Classes that I typically will teach as part of the foundation of the Buddhist teachings, but then I also taught kind of eight specialized classes that I haven't taught online or anywhere else. It was only that retreat where I started teaching there first these particular classes, and now what I'm doing over the next several weeks is sharing those classes with all of you so that you can learn the content. If you happen to not be able to make it to that retreat this past summer, now you can learn that. Same content, and it can be recorded for anybody who would like to be able to digest this content for the future. So, I'd like to welcome all of you to today's class. The topic that we're going to be studying is how to eliminate attachment to those closest to us. This is a topic that is very important and key for your progression to enlightenment, because in order to get to enlightenment, an individual would need to lead. Eliminate 100% of all cravings, desires, attachments. These cravings, desires, attachments—it's like carrying around a burden on your shoulders, where the mind is longing and yearning. It's wanting the objects of its affection, and if it gets what it wants, it gets these pleasant feelings. And if it doesn't get what it wants, it gets these painful feelings. And because of this, the mind is going to be very muddled or unconcentrated. It's going to be shaken up from time to time. Time as it goes up and down and up and down, and the way that you eliminate this is understand the wisdom of how to eliminate attachments. And because of the relationships that we have, oftentimes relationships are some of the most challenging attachments to eliminate. The attachment isn't the relationship itself; it's how the mind is longing and yearning in the relationship, oftentimes sabotaging the relationship itself. So I'm going to share with you how to eliminate attachments in relationships while still maintaining relationships. In this way, your relationships can be completely peaceful, completely joyful, and they'll truly help you as part of being able to progress in the world and accomplish the things that you would like to accomplish. Because as long as there's craving, desire, attachment in relationships, there's going to be discontentedness. And as part of this retreat, and as part of learning this topic, an individual would have already studied and understood the three universal truths, the four noble truths, the eightfold path, the five precepts, the teachings on true love, love without attachment, and things like this. So, if you haven't yet studied those things with me, then you may have certain questions as we go in today's class that is based on those particular teachings, because it's important to understand. And those, as you move into understanding how to eliminate attachment to those closest to us, so particularly it's the three universal truths and the four noble truths that's going to help you to be able to understand why it's even important to eliminate attachment to those closest to us. So, whether you're joining us for the first time or you've been joining us regularly, I'd like to welcome all of you to today's class. I'm going to share some visual aids to help help me be able to communicate these teachings to you today. And as we go, you're welcome to ask questions. You can put those into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, and our moderators will be able to help you to get your question asked during the class. If you're in Zoom, you can electronically raise your hand and ask any questions or follow up questions directly. I noticed that Bossum just logged in and. Bossum uh, Tonka is helping to moderate today, uh, but she's never actually done full moderation. Perhaps you might be able to communicate with her a bit and be able to work out something where you guys could help each other if you don't mind. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and share with you guys this topic of practicing non-attachment: how to eliminate attachment to those who are closest to us. The first thing to understand about this particular topic 
is that in order for you to get to the point where you're able to eliminate attachment to those who are closest to you, you're going to need to acquire wisdom. You're going to need to develop your life practice on the path to enlightenment so that you can deeply understand and practice the teachings, focusing on your development of these teachings. Because if you don't understand the wisdom of the three universal truths, the four noble truths, the eightfold path, the five precepts, and some other teachings that I mention, like how to practice true love, love without attachment, the Brahma Viharas, things like this, then it would be very challenging for you to ever get to the point where the mind's able to eliminate attachment to people that are closest to you. And as long as you have attachment in relationships, there's going to be discontentedness. You may argue, you may be angry at people, you may be sad, you may be lonely or bored, you may be jealous or resentful, you might feel guilt or shame or fear. All these discontent feelings and others are going to be produced when there's craving, desire, attachment in the mind. And your relationships will really struggle. And oftentimes what's happening is the mind is sabotaging your relationships and you might find it very challenging and very difficult to be able to have relationships because of the craving, desire, attachment. Oftentimes we think that it's love that is causing the mind to be angry or frustrated or sad or grieve in certain relationships, but it's actually not the love that's doing that. And when you gain the wisdom to understand that it's craving desire attachment through the Four Noble Truths, then you'll understand how to work to eliminate this. And I'm going to be covering some of that in today's class. But as you are perhaps maybe learning for the first time and you haven't understood craving desire attachment with me as part of the Four Noble Truths, let me help you to understand it a bit. Craving desire attachment is this mental longing with a strong eagerness. The way that the unenlightened mind bases its inner feelings on some impermanent condition. So there's this mental longing and strong eagerness. The mind is chasing after the objects of its affection. And if it gets what it wants, it gets pleasant feelings like happiness, excitement, elation, thrill, euphoria. But if it doesn't get the objects of its affection, then it experiences these painful feelings like sadness, anger, frustration, irritation, annoyance, guilt, you know, shame, fear, things like this. And then there's also feelings that are neither painful nor pleasant, like shyness or displeasure. Like if somebody came and sat really, really close to you who you didn't know, you might experience dissatisfaction in the mind. So this is discontentedness. The pleasant feelings, painful feelings, and neither painful nor pleasant. And what's happening is the unenlightened mind is basing its inner feelings on some impermanent condition. So if you get a new pair of shoes, so happy, so excited, or you get a new job, or you get a raise at work, so happy, so excited, so thrilled, or you look outside and it's sunny outside, you might get so happy, so excited and thrilled, but then that a pleasant feeling that you're experiencing, it's based on some condition. The condition is the new shoes, the new job, the raise, the sunny weather. This is the condition that is causing that uh, happy feeling. So because there's a craving for a new pair of shoes, when you get them, then the mind gets the pleasant feelings. Or because there's a craving, a desire, a yearning, a longing for a new job or a new income or for the weather to be sunny, when you get that, you get happy, excited, and elated. This is a conditioned feeling. But that is based on an impermanent condition. So when that condition changes, now your shoes aren't new anymore, or now you've lost your job, or now your income goes down, or now it's raining outside, it's no longer sunny. Now, because your inner feeling of happiness was based on this condition that's impermanent, now when this condition changes, the feeling is going to change. It's going to move from pleasant to painful, where now there might be anger or sadness or some other painful feeling. So as long as the unenlightened mind is doing this, then it's going to experience this discontentedness where the mind's going up and down and up and down at different times 
with some period of maybe peacefulness here and there, but it's going to experience this up and down effect where the mind is shaken up, it's uncalm, it's unsteady, and therefore the mind can't be concentrated and you can't practice wise decision making. So when you acquire the wisdom about these teachings and others, then you can cultivate the mind through training the mind in the way that the Buddha teaches as part of the Eightfold Path, and you can eliminate the way that the mind is basing its inner feelings on some impermanent condition. And that's where you can get to permanent peacefulness, permanent calmness, permanent serenity, permanent contentedness, and permanent joy. The enlightened mind is beyond pleasure and pain. It's no longer being shaken up by these impermanent conditions because it's no longer basing its inner feelings on these impermanent conditions. Well, some of the impermanent conditions that an unenlightened mind might base itself on is in these relationships that you have, you might base your inner feelings of happiness on whether you have a boyfriend or girlfriend, or whether you have a husband or wife, or whether your brothers and sisters do certain things, or whether your mom or dad or your grandparents or your siblings do certain things. If they do the things you want, maybe you get pleasant feelings. If they don't do the things you want, maybe you get painful feelings like anger and sadness. So as long as the mind is basing its inner feelings on some impermanent condition, like this person needs to do what I want, then you're going to sabotage your relationships because now you can't be permanently peaceful and joyful in your relationships because your inner feelings are based on whether this person does certain things or doesn't do certain things. If my friend calls me, I'll be happy. If they don't call me, I'll be sad or angry or, or lonely. If my uh, husband or wife gets me a certain gift, I'll be happy. If they don't give me that gift, I'll be angry or sad. So the unenlightened mind doesn't realize that it's actually sabotaging itself and it's sabotaging relationships because the unenlightened mind is going to be discontent in relationships as long as there's craving, desire, attachment. And Typically, what the unenlightened mind does when it lacks the wisdom of these teachings is it's going to blame that painful feeling of anger, sadness, frustration, and other discontent feelings on the other person. So if you don't get what you want in this relationship, then you'll typically blame this on the other person, thinking that they're causing your painful feelings rather than realize you're causing the painful feelings yourself. And then what happens is when the mind falsely attributes these painful feelings to the other person, then the mind wants to push this person out of your life. This is called aversion, where you're now pushing this person out of your life thinking that's going to solve the problem. But it doesn't solve the problem because the very next relationship you're in, you get discontent again in that relationship too. And then because the mind lacks wisdom, it then pushes that person away. And the mind stuck in this continuous cycle over and over and over again, misunderstanding what's actually truly happening. Because the mind misunderstands and thinks that the other person is causing you to be angry or sad or frustrated or what have you, it keeps pushing people out of your life and you find it very challenging to have fulfilling relationships. So when you get this craving, desire, attachment out of the way, now you can practice true love where you love the person as they are. You have this genuine interest in seeing them be well. And now, because you don't have a craving, desire, attachment, you don't have a yearning for this person to be a certain way or function a certain way, now you can be peaceful and joyful in all your relationships because you're not trying to pressure or force somebody into doing something your way. So in the unenlightened mind, when we don't understand true love and love without attachment, then there's this craving, desire, attachment that's masquerading as love. And when we have craving, desire, attachment in our mind and it's masquerading as love, we might think like, okay, you've met my conditions. And now that you've met my conditions, I will love you. I will say that I love you. And now, as long as you're meeting my conditions, I love you. 
But then the mind keeps adding these additional conditions to this list. These expectations continue to grow in the relationship. And eventually it gets to the point where this person can't meet your expectations anymore. And we say, I don't love you anymore. I've fallen out of love with you. But this actually isn't love. This is craving, desire, attachment, masquerading as love. So what we say when we misunderstand craving, desire, attachment as love is we say, I love you. Therefore, I would like you to be with me because you make me happy, right? I love you. Therefore, I want you to be with me because you make me happy. This actually isn't love. This is craving, desire, attachment. You make me happy. But when I don't have you, then I'm not happy anymore. This isn't actually love. This is selfishness. This is the mind trying to hold on to this person, getting them to do what you want them to do, having certain expectations. And it's only when they meet your expectations that the mind says, I love you. And then when they stop meeting your expectations, the mind says, I don't love you anymore. Right? True love or love without attachment, where you love somebody as they are, you have unconditional love for them, is I love you, therefore I would like to see you be well, right? If you love somebody and you're just interested in seeing them be well, you shouldn't want anything from them. You're just interested in seeing them be well. That's what true love is. And therefore you can love everybody in the world because you're interested in seeing everybody be well. But over here, where you want something from somebody, you expect something from somebody, you have certain conditions that need to be met in order for you to feel that you're getting what you want out of this relationship. Now you can't be in a relationship uh, with everybody. You can't be friendly with everybody because it's only when people are meeting your expectations that you can actually be peaceful and joyful in a relationship. As soon as somebody stops meeting your expectations, you can no longer be you know, peaceful and joyful in that relationship. But over here, where you don't have an expectation of wanting this person to be a certain way, you have unconditional love. You just love them as they are and you're interested in seeing them be well. Now you can love everybody because you don't want anything from them. You're just interested in seeing them be well. So when there's true love in the mind, then you're starting to practice more and more of this non-attachment. And you can start eliminating more and more of the attachment that's embedded in the mind in these relationships. Part of loving somebody as they are and having true love is understanding that everybody ha has the freedom to make their own decisions. That as long as you're trying to force or pressure somebody into making certain decisions that you want in the relationship, then this isn't allowing everyone to have their own freedom of decisions. This is, you didn't get what you wanted, and now when this person starts to make decisions that you disagree with, you might try to pressure or force this individual into doing things your way. And now the relationship feels very uncomfortable because the other person wants to make a certain decision that you disagree with and you you're interested in one thing, you want one thing, they want something else and both people can't be content and joyful because you can't both get what you want because they're opposite things. So when somebody makes a decision in a relationship, the other person needs to just be accepting of that and realize that that's their decision and accept it and understand that that's their decision rather than trying to force or pressure them into making any particular decision or another. We can ask and invite people into our life. We can ask and invite people to do certain things, but it needs to be that individual's choice. As soon as we try to pressure or force somebody into doing something our way, this is because of craving desire attachment. And as I mentioned, both people are gonna feel uncomfortable because if anybody tries to force or pressure you into doing something that you're not interested in doing, you don't like that, right? You don't feel comfortable when somebody's trying to force and pressure you to do something that you don't like to do. But the unenlightened mind doesn't think about that when it's trying to pressure and force other people to do things. The unenlightened mind tends to be very selfish. The unenlightened mind doesn't want other people to tell us what to do. 
But the unenlightened mind wants to tell other people what to do. This is part of the ego that's in there trying to tell other people what to do and force and control and get what we want out of this relationship. Where when you can gradually move the mind towards practicing true love, where you don't necessarily want anything out of this relationship, all you're interested in is seeing this other person be well, then you can be liberated from any discontentedness in the relationship. Because if all you're interested in is seeing this other person be well, no matter what their decisions are, you just accept them. Now, of course, in any relationship, there's baseline needs. There needs to be politeness, kindness, friendliness, and respect. If an individual is impolite, unkind, unfriendly, or disrespectful, this doesn't provide the foundation that's needed to have a healthy relationship. But that's a need, that's not a want, right? As long as you want somebody to always be polite, kind, friendly, and respectful, then the mind's going to be discontent when they're not. But when you can love people as they are, realizing that they're struggling in life, just like you, perhaps, then you're going to understand that sometimes they're going to be impolite, unkind, unfriendly, and disrespectful. But if, you know, 95% of the time they're polite, kind, friendly, and respectful, perhaps you look past that other part that they're struggling on. Perhaps they apologize when they're impolite, unkind, unfriendly, and disrespectful, and therefore you can maintain a relationship. But if you want this person to be a certain way, and you can only be friends with people who are always polite, kind, friendly, and respectful, then you're only going to be able to be friendly with enlightened beings because it's only enlightened beings that are going to be always polite, kind, friendly, and respectful. All other beings who are in the process of moving towards enlightenment, meaning they're unenlightened, they're going to experience some occasions where they're impolite, unkind, unfriendly, and disrespectful. So when you have a want for people to be a certain way and we try to force that upon them, then when you don't get what you want, you'll have discontentedness in the relationship. But when you can just love people unconditionally as they are and realize that they're struggling perhaps just like you and any discontentedness that you experience, you're causing it yourself due to your own cravings, desire, attachments. Now you can find a way to love all beings and peacefully coexist in all relationships harmoniously. And this is where the real work comes in. So even after I explain all of these things today in our today's class, you might need to learn this multiple times and then you're going to need to make multiple efforts to practice love without attachment and learning how to eliminate attachments to those that are closest to you so that your relationships can become more and more harmonious. This isn't a matter of just listening to me talk once and then you do one thing and then all of a sudden all your relationships are completely peaceful. Instead, it's doing the work, working through some of the struggles and the challenges and the difficulties of no longer thinking about relationships in the same way that you have, no longer functioning in relationships in the same way that you have necessarily and move the mind towards this transformation where it's now practicing true love, love without attachment and more and more and more, then your relationships will become more peaceful and more joyful because you're arising the qualities in the mind that are closer to practicing non-attachment where you've gained the wisdom in a class like this, you might need to have multiple situations where you're learning this and then you're making repeated efforts to practice this more and more closely. In the relationships where you're arguing or you're angry or you're sad the most, those are the ones that you have the deepest attachment in. If you're feeling like you're missing somebody, even people who have already died, or if you're feeling lonely or bored in certain situations based on not being around certain people, this is where you know that you're attached to this individual. And you can maintain the relationship. And But what you'll need to do is get to the point where you no longer have attachment. And this is where your mind can be liberated from no longer feeling angry and sad or bored or lonely or missing this person. Instead, you can have your relationship, you can enjoy your relationship, but you're not basing your inner feelings on what's going on in this relationship. 
one of the modern ways that people talk about relationships that have attachments is they talk about codependency. When your inner feelings are dependent on what's going on with another person, this means your mind is attached. You're having craving, desire, attachment in the relationship, which means your mind can't be liberated. Your mind can't experience peacefulness and joyfulness always because your inner feelings are connected and based on what's going on with this other individual. So you're going to need to learn how to love without attachment and eliminate attachment to those who are closest to you. So let me share some more things with you related to this particular topic. So when we're in relationships where there's attachment and there's this mental longing and strong eagerness, wanting the other person to be a certain way, oftentimes when they're struggling with a certain situation, you might feel your mind wanting to jump in and solve their problems because maybe you're struggling to observe that they're struggling. So your child or your parents or your life partner or other people around you, when you see them struggling with a certain situation, you might want to jump in, make a whole bunch of decisions for them to eliminate their struggle. But this is actually causing difficulties because when you jump in and attempt to solve all their problems through your decision making, that person doesn't Uh, have the opportunity to cultivate the wisdom to overcome that struggle. The whole reason why they're struggling to begin with is because they lack wisdom, how to make certain decisions to overcome the struggle. So if you have the wisdom to overcome that struggle and you jump in to solve the problem through making decisions, you've inhibited that person from being able to cultivate wisdom to be able to make decisions in the future, to be able to overcome that struggle. You've essentially ensured that they're gonna struggle again in the future. And you're probably not gonna be around in the future when they're struggling because you're impermanent and now they're going to struggle in the future. So if you are finding it very difficult to observe your life partner, your children, your parents, or other people in your life struggling, this is because of your attachment. And when you train your mind to let go and understand that struggle is part of the process in order to get to wisdom, then you can step back and allow this person to struggle with you kind of on a parallel process where you might give them advice, you might give them suggestions, you might give them guidance to help them cultivate wisdom to overcome the struggle. Then in the future, when they meet that same struggle, they'll have the wisdom on board to be able to ensure that they can overcome that every single time and they'll no longer struggle. But as long as you jump in because you're struggling to observe them struggle and you're jumping in to make a bunch of decisions and solve the problems, then you're just ensuring that their struggle continues. So you're going to need to restrain the mind and understand that your role in these relationships is not to jump in and solve a whole bunch of problems for somebody else and be their savior, so to speak. Instead, the best thing you can do if you have love, which is a genuine interest in seeing this being be well, that when they're struggling, that you perhaps offer suggestions or advice or guidance, helping them to cultivate wisdom, because as they cultivate wisdom through your advice, then they will be able to overcome that struggle with you helping them and assisting them, but you're helping them through giving them advice and suggestions to cultivate wisdom. And then any future challenge that is similar to that same situation, they'll already have the wisdom on board to overcome that. So in that situation, that's how you truly help somebody. Oftentimes we think the way to help somebody is jump in and solve everything for them. But that's actually making the problem worse because they didn't get a chance to cultivate the wisdom. So if you find your mind struggling right away, you should acknowledge that as your own cravings, desires, attachments, that you're struggling to observe somebody else struggle. And you should move towards helping them get advice, suggestions, and guidance so that they can cultivate wisdom. But if they're not interested in your advice, your suggestions, or your guidance, 
You need to be comfortable with that and just let go that they're going to need to struggle. That's how you gained wisdom in your life is you learned from teachers in some situations, but in other situations you had to go through the struggle and that's what helped you to learn. And if they're not interested in your advice or your guidance or any suggestions from you, then they're going to just need to struggle through that. And you're going to need to deal with your struggle of watching them struggle. That's your own craving, desire, attachment. You need to eliminate that. Understand that everybody is an individual being. Sometimes in Western cultures, we're taught that when you get married, you're now one person and that you should agree on everything. And that when we agree on everything, we're functioning as one person now because we're married or we're a life partner or we're living together. We should agree on everything. But this isn't actually possible. Because of the universal truth of impermanence, Two individuals cannot agree on 100% of anything at all. There's going to be certain times where individuals are going to disagree, and that's okay. If you understand that everybody is their own individual being, and they're not always going to agree, then you won't try to force agreements. But if you're from the mindset or you've been taught that when you have a life partner or you have a boyfriend or girlfriend or you're living with somebody, that you guys should be one person and all your decisions should match and you should agree on everything, this is going to lead to problems in your relationship because it's not possible for you guys to agree on everything. So if you keep thinking that way, which is part of what's taught in the world in some cultures, then you're going to continue to experience discontentedness. So by stepping away from that and letting that go and realizing that that is an untruth, that it's not possible for two people to completely agree on everything, then you can understand that you're have a relationship with a life partner or a boyfriend, girlfriend, or you're living with somebody who you guys are two independent beings. You're individual beings. You're going to have completely unique experiences in life. You guys have had two completely different lives. So you guys are going to look at the world in a different way. So that means that based on your own unique situations in your own unique experiences, you're going to have certain thoughts and opinions and views about how to handle any particular situation. And that's going to be different. And that's okay. Because when we think that everybody should agree, then rather than having discussions, what happens is there's this forced agreement where we try to force others in the unenlightened mind to agree with us. That when we hear that somebody disagrees, oftentimes the conversation becomes very aggressive or hostile or bitter, trying to force this other person to agree with us. And when the mind is uncomfortable with this disagreement, then we damage the relationship because the speech and the actions become unskillful. This is just the mind having craving, desire, attachment in the relationship, thinking that everybody should agree with you. But if you understand in permanence that it's impossible for everyone to agree with you, then when you hear that your partner or your children or your parents or your siblings, your coworkers, your friends, or somebody else disagrees with you, you just understand that's normal. That's completely natural. And because people are going to disagree with you, you don't, you don't try to force agreement. <coughs> Okay, it looks like our moderators took care of that. Apologize there, guys. Just looks like we had somebody come in. All right, so as long as the unenlightened mind thinks that there should be agreement and it's required for everyone to permanently agree with you, then you're going to be in a situation where you're going to want everybody to agree with you and try to force this agreement. But this isn't actually possible. So what you would like to do is get to a point where you can be comfortable that people are going to disagree with you. I'm going to 
see okay there we go I've got zoom back all right so people on zoom I was just finishing up and saying that once you realize that it's not possible for people to permanently agree with you and you realize in permanence that there's going to be situations where people are going to disagree with you then you won't try to force agreement and you can have discussions instead because as long as you're trying to force agreement there's going to be this unskillful conduct as part of it your intentions your speech and your actions are going to be unwise and unskillful and this is where relationships get damaged so if you're finding that you're uncomfortable with disagreement understand that disagreement is not the same thing as disrespect. Sometimes the way that people look at it is when someone disagrees with us, that then this is disrespectful. But disagreement and disrespect are two different things. They're not actually the same thing. Disagreement is just impermanence, that you have one opinion based on all your experiences in life, and somebody else has a different opinion based on their experiences. And it's not that necessarily one person's right and one person's wrong, and now we need to fight to the death to determine who's right and who's wrong. That's what animals do, right? But we're human beings. We don't need to do that. We can understand impermanence in that this individual has had completely different experiences than you have, so therefore, of course, they're going to have completely different opinions and views, and that's okay. And when somebody else has a disagreement, perhaps what you might try to do is ask them questions and understand their disagreement. And the more questions you ask, the more you understand about why they have the certain opinion that they have. By the end of the conversation, you might agree with them. Or even if you don't agree with them, at the end of the conversation, you still disagree. At least you'll understand why they have the opinion that they have. And now you can still be friends. You can still be coworkers. You can still be life partners. You can still be boyfriend and girlfriend. But if there's disagreement and we take that as disrespect, and now there's this hostility and this bitterness to try to convince this person through a forced agreement that they have to agree with you, now, because of the unskillfulness and the craving for permanence, you might feel that you can only be friends with this person or you can only be a life partner with this person if they agree with you. But this is, once again, that conditions. This is the craving desire attachments. This isn't loving somebody as they are. This is, I can only be friends with you if you meet my conditions. And one of my conditions is you've got to agree with everything that I agree with. Well, if you're going to only be able to be friends with people who agree with you, you're not going to be able to be friends with anybody but yourself because it's not possible for everyone to agree with you on every single topic. So by understanding that it's okay to have discussions, you're not interested in force agreement whatsoever, have discussions where people disagree with you. It's completely normal. It's not disrespect. And you can either just choose to move on in the conversation or you could choose to ask questions and try to understand the other person or not. Maybe if you're observing that the mind's frustrated or irritated or angry, maybe you don't ask them questions. Maybe you just move on in the conversation and that's okay. One of the other things you can do in order to work towards practicing non-attachment and eliminating attachment to those who are closest to you is to learn how to spend time alone. Oftentimes, when the mind is attached to other people and attached in relationships, you might feel like you have to be with this person continuously on an ongoing basis. And the mind can only be peaceful and joyful if you're with this other person. That maybe when you go to the movies, you can't go to the movies alone. You have to go with somebody else. Or if you like to go to dinner, you can't go to dinner alone. You can only go with somebody else or things like this, right? You can't go to the shopping mall alone. You can only go with other people. This is attachment. This is craving, desire, attachment. The mind's only able to do something if you've got somebody else with you. But what you would like to do is get to the point where your mind's liberated. You can do anything and everything. You can do it with people or you can do it without people. And you can do it either way. But you would only be able to learn and practice to be able to do that if you spend time alone. The Buddha used to go out into the forest and spend time alone frequently. There's certain teachings and certain stories in the Pali Canon where he would be teaching a particular topic and that evening as everybody fell asleep, 
you know, at some point he would have woken up early and he would have left. And then as his students woke up in the morning, he'd be gone and they didn't know where he was. He didn't tell them that he was leaving. He'd be just gone and he'd be in the forest. And sometimes he didn't come back for three months and the students had no idea where he was at. And they just had to go about their day and do the things that they were going to normally do. And this was very wise for him as a teacher to train their mind to not be attached to him and not expect that he's going to always be there. So the way that he trained his mind to be content and joyful and peaceful to be alone is that he spent time alone. Oftentimes, if you spend time alone and you feel bored or lonely, the unenlightened mind thinks the way to solve that is to just always be with people and to not go anywhere unless you're with people. But this actually doesn't solve the problem. It's actually the problem that the mind is craving, it's grasping, it's holding on, and it can only do something if you've got somebody with you. But in the situation where the mind feels uncomfortable, it feels unpeaceful, it doesn't feel joyful when it's alone, it feels that boredom or loneliness, or you're missing somebody, the solution isn't to go be with that person. That's just going to keep the craving going. It's going to keep the attachment going. Instead, the way to solve this and eliminate the attachment is to spend more time alone and train the mind to be alone. And while you're alone, train the mind to be peaceful and joyful while you're alone. So you can take yourself out on a date, right? You can take yourself out to dinner. You can take yourself out to the movies. You can take yourself out to the mall. You can do things alone. And this is very helpful for the mind so that you can see that you can do things alone. You can be just as peaceful and just as joyful with people as you are when you're alone. And then your mind can be liberated that it won't hold on to people thinking that you can only be peaceful and joyful when you're with other people. Because that's what the unenlightened mind is going to want to do. It's going to want to hold on to these relationships. And it thinks that it can't be peaceful and joyful unless it's with other people. But when you let go and you spend time alone training the mind to be peaceful and joyful over a consistent long-term period of time, then more and more you can see like, yeah, I can enjoy my time alone. This is wonderful. So while you're with somebody and you're experiencing a certain amount of enjoyment that, wow, you're with your boyfriend or your girlfriend or you're with your children or your grandchildren or you're with your parents or your friends or your coworkers and you're having a certain amount of enjoyment with these people, be sure you remind the mind several times that this is impermanent. This time that we're spending together, this enjoyment that we're having together, this is impermanent. It's not going to last forever. At some point, you guys are going to go away, right? Your wife or your husband's going to go to work. Your children are going to go to school. Uh, grandparents are going to pass away. They're going to die. Uh, your friends are going to go do other things. So when you're with somebody and you're feeling a certain amount of enjoyment, rather than cling to that, hold on to that, craving for it to be permanent, Remind yourself that this time together is impermanent. It's going to come to an end. And then when you're apart and you're away and you're alone, remind the mind there that that is impermanent too. Being alone is not permanent. You are going to end up being with other people at some point. So when you're together with people, that's impermanent. So that joy, that enjoyment that you're experiencing, any kind of uh, experiences that you're having together. It is impermanent and remind the mind of that. And then when you're away and you're alone and you're out on a date by yourself, remind yourself that that's impermanent too, that at some point you'll be with somebody again. And there the mind can be more content in that situation when you're alone, rather than when you're alone, craving to be with other people. This is where the boredom or loneliness or you're missing somebody. If you're missing somebody, this is because the mind has attachment. It's attached to that person. And when you're away from them, you are missing them. The mind is discontent. You can't be content with just being alone because you're missing that person because the mind is attached to that person. So when you can let go and just Find the peace and the joy when you're alone and when you're together. Now your mind can be more liberated in this relationship. Let me pause here and see what questions you guys have about things that I've talked about so far. 
You can put your questions into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom. If you're in Zoom, you can electronically raise your hand and ask any questions or follow-up questions directly. Yes, teacher David. Um, I'm not saying uh, that there is a relationship between attachment and judgment. For example, people that I'm very close to, I tend to be more judgmental toward that. And certain things bother me. And with people that I just work with or my neighbors, that like I can accept them the, the way that they are, no problem. But more close to the people, more judgmental I am. And I'm rea realizing more and more how judgment, judgment is, um, is a big, big problem. And I'm trying to work on that. So if you can speak to that, that would be nice. Sure, this is very insightful of you, Tonka. The reason why the mind's doing this is because of the craving desire attachment. The craving desire attachment is that mental longing and strong eagerness, chasing after the objects of your affection. Another way to say that as it relates to relationships is the mind wants things to be a certain way. So if you have a son or a daughter or grandchildren or friends or, or relatives, you want them to be a certain way. And then the mind's ego, this conceit, that's where the judgment comes from, the measuring and comparing. This conceit arises thinking that you know best. You know best. You know what everybody should be doing based on your opinions, based on your experiences. The conceit in there is looking out through the world through this dirty window and there's the conceits in there and there's this craving wanting people to be a certain way and now when they're not that way the mind is judging that and it's saying ah oh, you're not this way you should be that way or you're not this way you should be that way the mind is going through that judgment so what you would like to do is get rid of the craving desire attachment learning the things that i'm sharing with you today and and others and then the mind needs to get rid of that conceit as well. That's that upper fetter, that higher fetter, where the mind is arrogant and prideful. There's this measuring and comparing. The mind thinks that it's superior or inferior to other beings. As long as that conceit's in there, the mind is going to judge other people. But it's that conceit with the craving the attachment that when you're looking at other people that are the ones that you have the deep attachment to, they're not doing the things you want. And now the mind is more readily uh, judging them because of the combination of the craving and the conceit. Thank you, teacher David. Mm -hmm. uh, Basim uh, has his hand raised. Let's go to him, please. Thanks, Tunka. Well, so about the point uh, related to time alone, it makes sense that the mind may be or can be attached to some people whom we are in contact with. So what about or why does the mind sometimes get attached to people who, has, who have already lived? I mean, uh, people who has uh, passed away, people who has died. So is it in this case, attachment to people themselves or to the memories with them or uh, uh, pleasant feelings we had when we were with them. So what it is, is the mind has this mental longing and strong eagerness. It's craving permanence. It doesn't understand impermanence. And even if it understands it intellectually, it's not practicing it. So the mind is holding on. So at some point when you were with, say, your grandparents, there were certain pleasant feelings, right? Grandparents feed us, they bathe us, they might give us a little bit of money, they might give us gifts, they might do all these other things where there's these pleasant feelings that arise associated with our grandparents. And now the mind is craving for those pleasant feelings. It wants that happiness, that excitement, that elation, the thrill. It's craving this permanence. And now when grandparents die, for example, now the mind still has that craving. It wants those pleasant feelings. It thinks the only way you can get those pleasant feelings is if it holds on to grandma and grandpa. So this is why the mind is doing what it's doing. It's not the attachment to memories because you can have memories without craving, desire, attachment. When you get the craving, desire, attachment out of the way, there's still gonna be memories about the great experiences you've had with these people, 
but the mind's not going to cling to those wanting them to be permanent. The mind's going to already know that they are impermanent and it's no longer basing its inner feelings on having grandma or grandpa around all the time. So while the mind is experiencing interactions with grandma and grandpa, the mind needs to learn this is impermanent, that I'm not going to have grandma and grandpa permanently. These things that we're doing together that are enjoyable, these aren't permanent. I'm just going to enjoy them in the present moment. And then when they're over, they're over and I just move on. Uh, so this is the way that you would like to train the mind. And the more things that I share with you guys today, you'll see more about how to actually accomplish this. So far, I'm kind of describing some of the problem and then some of the solutions as well. But we're going to start really getting into the solutions after this. So it's the mind craving permanence. It's the mind craving those pleasant feelings, wanting these pleasant feelings, associating those pleasant feelings with grandma and grandpa thinking that grandma and grandpa is what it takes in order to get those pleasant feelings. So just like the unenlightened mind falsely attributes painful feelings to somebody else and pushes that person away, well, when grandma and grandpa give us all these pleasant feelings, at least that's what the mind's perceiving, that's where the mind's holding on and clinging and thinking that grandma and grandpa is what's creating the pleasant feelings. But it's actually not grandma and grandpa that's creating the pleasant feelings. It's the craving, desire, attachment, the longing and yearning that's creating that. So now when grandma and grandpa are gone, we think the pleasant feelings are gone. And now the mind moves to sadness or frustration or irritation. So the real problem isn't that grandma and grandpa are gone. That's not the actual problem. The problem is the craving, desire, attachment. And this is where you can understand that the same reason why people are discontent in a funeral is the same reason why they're discontent in a wedding. Because of craving, desire, attachment, this craving for permanence, when grandma and grandpa die, the mind is sad or frustrated or angry because the mind is wanting grandma and grandpa to be permanent. But then also at brother and sister's wedding, the mind might be sad there too or angry or frustrated because the mind is holding on to brother and sister, wanting brother and sister to be permanent. It's not comfortable letting brother and sister go off on into their own life with this new partner. So the mind might be discontent in that situation too. So the problem isn't that brother and sister got married. The problem isn't that grandma and grandpa died because this is all just impermanence. That's a universal truth. The true problem that the mind is experiencing is the craving, desire, attachment, wanting these things to be permanent when they're not. Thank you, Teacher. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. We have a question on YouTube from Middle Way. Uh, I guess it applies if children are attached uh, to some things. When kid asks, I'm bored. What is the best way to teach kids to the teaching? What they should do when they say that they want to watch play electronics. So I guess when the children are attached to, to phones and uh, TVs and computers. Yeah, so in a situation where someone's mind is attached to stimulation like video games, computers, phones, stuff like this, when they're not doing those things, then the mind's going to be bored, right? Because the mind is craving and attached to these electronic devices. And now when it doesn't have that, that's where the boredom arises in the mind. So what you do is you need to gradually train their mind to understand craving, desire, attachment, as well as impermanence through the three universal truths, the Four Noble Truths, just like I teach, there's ways to teach this to children as well, which is that class I taught previously, that you teach the children this, and then what you need to do as a adult, as their parent, is introduce some impermanence into the situation so that they can train their mind to let go. And this is one of the most challenging things for children. I've been working with my own son for many years, helping him to eliminate his attachment to electronic devices. And he's still attached. It, it, you know, it's been four years that I've been training him on these things. And this is one of his strongest attachments. So I'm constantly introducing some impermanence where when he's been watching uh, YouTube or he's been playing video games or something on his computer a whole lot, I will just walk up to him and I will just 
politely take it away, or I will close his screen, or I will ask him to come help me with something. So I'll say, you know, uh, Bailan, I need you to come help me put away the dishes in the kitchen. And he'll say, okay. And then he'll get up and he'll come help me. And then he'll, I'll watch him get ready to walk back to open up his computer and start playing on the computer again. And right when he sits down, I'll say, oh, dad needs you to help me with laundry. Can you come help me with laundry? Right. So then he'll come help me with laundry and he'll do that. And then he'll get ready to go sit down and then he'll be like, oh, you know, we need to sweep. The house needs to, to be swept up. Can you get a broom and a dustpan so we can sweep up the house? So I do this constantly over multiple, multiple, multiple days. And there's times where he doesn't play his games for extended periods of time, but it's been four years now. His mind has diminished his discontentedness uh, significantly, but he still hasn't eliminated his attachment 100%. So you'll need to educate them, help them to cultivate the wisdom of the three universal truths and the four noble truths. And then you're gonna need to be there to introduce in permanence because what the mind craves is it craves permanence. So if they're on a game and you say, come help me with dishes. They're like, oh, I don't wanna help. I wanna play my game. Uh, you know, I wanna play my game. And then when they even put their game down, they're grumpy and they're irritable. Maybe they're helping you put away the dishes, but they're grumpy and they're irritable. This is because the mind is craving the game. So what you're doing is you're trying to introduce in permanence so that their mind doesn't keep craving permanence over and over and over again. So going two or three days without, without it, maybe five days without it. Uh, you know, introducing impermanence the way that I talked about getting up to do tasks and things like this. Or sometimes my son, he'll be playing his computer uh, up until it's time to go to bed <clears throat> and he'll be playing in the living room and then he'll go up to his to the room to sleep. And then at nighttime, I will take the computer and I'll hide it because I know when he's coming downstairs in the morning, he's expecting to jump right back on the computer and he's expecting for that computer to be there. But when he comes down and he sees the computer isn't there, this is impermanence. So I'm trying to find all these different ways to introduce impermanence into his life where his mind doesn't get an opportunity to keep holding on and holding on to the electronic device. And you're going to need to do this for an extended period of time because there's so much stimulation in those electronic games, uh, in these electronic devices. That's why their mind gets so attached to it. And at the young age of a child, their mind is very formidable. They can actually form attachments relatively quickly. One time my uh, wife went out to buy my son a new motorbike helmet because I had his old motorbike helmet on my motorbike and I had it strapped on the seat. And as I was driving down the road, the strap came undone and it fell into the road. And I didn't realize it because I was driving and he was at school. And then when I got home, the motorbike helmet was gone. And then my son, my wife picked him up at school that day and she went out to go buy him a new motorbike helmet. And then I called him, uh, happened to call them on the phone and he's like, hey dad, I just got a new motorbike helmet. I was like, oh really, you got a new motorbike helmet? He said, yeah, it's so beautiful. It's so, it's blue, it's this, it's that. It's a full face helmet, such and such and such and such. And he goes, dad, you need to be sure not to scratch this one. Don't scratch it, all right? And right away, my mind's like, oh, he's getting attached to it already. And he just got this helmet, right? Because he's trying to keep it permanently looking beautiful. Well, it'd be wonderful to not scratch this motorbike helmet. But I know in permanence that it's not possible for the motorbike helmet to never get scratched. So right away, when he's kind of complaining to me about not scratching and he, he said, you know, make sure when you tie it on the motorbike that you tie it really tight so that it doesn't fall off. And he's kind of trying to instruct me how to keep this helmet permanently. Right away, I recognize that as craving desire attachment. And I'm like, oh, by line, you just got this helmet. Are you attached to it already? But he understood what that meant at that point because I'd already trained him on what craving desire attachment is. And he was able to relatively easily let that attachment go. And now this motorbike helmet has scratches all over it, right? He doesn't even care. He just puts it on and wears it because he realizes that's part of the whole thing. So educating them on what the three universal truths are, the four noble truths are, introducing impermanence regularly throughout 
the days and weeks that you're with them and then try to get ahead of the curve that where you see craving desire attachment starting to form that you try to help them cut it off before it ever gets formed that's where you can get really successful that if you can get ahead of the curve and help them cut it off before they ever get formed in the mind then it won't be so hard for them to let it go because it never actually got fully formed and rooted in the mind thank you teacher david mm -hmm. no more questions at this time okay so let's go to the next thing that i would like to share with you guys on this topic which is talking about communicating with a purpose when there's craving desire attachment in the mind in perhaps you're bored or you're lonely or you're missing somebody you might call somebody and just talk with idle chatter or frivolous speech you know saying things like you know where are you what are you doing you know i miss you you know i want you to do this or i want you to do this you know i want you to pick up eggs before you come home or can you pick up milk on your way home or can you pick up some fruit on your way home there's what i would call unpurposeful speech so if you're calling somebody saying things like where are you what are you doing i miss you um, oh, I, I can't live without you kind of thing. Like, why are you gone? Why are you gone so long? I want you to come back. This is just allowing the attachment to continue and it's coming through your speech and your actions and you're starting to now put this burden on this other person and this is going to sabotage relationships. And the same thing is if your partner's out or your children are out or different people, friends, and you say, I want you to pick up some fruit on the way home or I want you to pick up a pizza on your way home. That want, that's that craving, desire, attachment. I want you to do something or I want you to do this or I want you to function in this way. What you would like to do is change your language and this will start changing the way you think about your relationships and the way that you interact in the world as long as you keep using that word want that's that longing and yearning so what you would like to do is transform this where you're inviting the person or you're allowing them to make their own choice so let's just say you need some food at home instead of saying i want you to pick up a pizza on the way home you might say you know we don't have much food at home i was wondering would you like to get a piece of or would you like to get a pizza on your way home from work and they're like oh uh, yeah i can do that i can pick up a pizza okay great that'd be wonderful or if they say, no, I'm not able to pick up a pizza. Okay, is there something else that you'd be able to pick up on the way home? They might say yes, or they might say no. This is where an enlightened being is gonna be a, a great problem solver. But what you're not interested in doing is where they say yes, you're not interested in getting all these pleasant feelings in the mind, like, yay, they're gonna get pizza. Or if they say no, you're not interested in getting these painful feelings or this anger, frustration. Why can't you get pizza? We're all hungry, we need you to get pizza, right? Instead of that, what you would like to do is just accept their decision, right? Love them as they are. They've made their choice. They're not able to pick up the pizza. Or they're not able to pick up the fruits or whatever it is that you're interested in them getting. So instead, you just become a problem solver and figure out how to solve this issue. Whereas if you want them to get something and they're not able to do it, you might get angry or frustrated. Whereas if you have an interest in them doing something or you have this goal or this objective or you're inviting them, would it be possible for you to stop by the store and pick up some fruit on your way home. And if they say, yes, I can do that. Or if they say no, then you need to accept whatever decision they make. But as long as you have that want in there and you're communicating it as a want, now the mind is craving. It's having this desire, this attachment. And then you're either gonna get pleasant feelings when they say yes, or you're gonna get painful feelings when they say no. But when it's just an interest and it's a goal and you realize that they may or may not be able to accomplish what it is that you're asking, now your mind can be peaceful and joyful and you don't put this burden, you're not trying to force them to be able to do things the way that you want them to do. Instead, you can just, like I said, have this interest or this goal, realize that sometimes they're gonna say yes, sometimes they're gonna say no, 
but you're not interested in sabotaging this relationship with unskillful conduct like anger or bitterness or hostility, that you just accept whatever decision they say and then you work and problem solve this and figure out how are we going to get some food in the house, right? There's other options besides this person stopping off and getting food. But when there's craving and there's this permanence that the mind wants, you might think that your only option is to force this person to do something the way you want them to do it. And if they won't do it the way you want, you might feel like they don't love you. But in reality, that's not love. That's craving desire attachment. Maybe this person's just really tired and they would like to get home. Or maybe they don't have a lot of gas. Or maybe they have some other thing that they're working on and they need to get home in a certain amount of time. So you would like to not have that craving desire attachment, accept whatever answer they have, and then just problem solve it. So if you transform your language and the way that you talk to people, you'll probably find that people are more willing to actually do things for you when you don't use the words want. Uh, instead, you say, would you like to do this? Or can you do this? Would it be possible for you to do this? Um, I would like for you to be able to do this if it's possible, right? These are great ways to communicate because you're not trying to force them to do anything particular. You're just inviting them to be able to make their own choice. And then whatever their choice is, you just accept it. Rather than trying to coerce them or force them to change their decision, you just accept whatever decision they make. And now everybody can be peaceful because if somebody says, no, I don't want to do that, and you try to force them to do it, they're gonna feel uncomfortable and you're gonna feel uncomfortable too. So if you're able to just accept people's decisions, then not only will you accept their decisions, but then they'll also learn to accept your decisions, that when they ask you for something, you may or may not be able to do that. And now in your relationship, everybody's able to do the things that they like. So if I went to my wife and I said, hey, my son and I, we're going out to the mall. We want you to come to the mall with us. And she's like, no, I'm not interested in going to the mall. I'd like to stay here and rest. And I'm like, oh, come on, mom. You gotta come to the mall with us. We want you to watch the movie. Come on, come on, come on, come on. This is pressuring her to do something that she's not interested in doing. She, she's, she would like to stay at home and rest. So even if I forced her and forced her and forced her and she eventually agreed to come to the movies, she's gonna have a miserable time because she's not interested in going to the movies. She's essentially being coerced into coming to the movies. So now it's not gonna be j joyful anyway because maybe she's gonna be a bit grumpy and now she's grumpy so other people are grumpy in the, in the group. So if when she says she would like to stay at home and we just say, okay, that's, that's great, maybe you can go another time. Now she gets to stay at home and rest and relax which is what she would like to do. My son and I get to go to the movies because that's what we would like to do. We're unattached to mom. And now we go enjoy the movie. She enjoys resting at home. And then when we come back home, now we get to spend time together. We're all peaceful and joyful because we all got to do what it is that we would like to do. Rather than continuing to force each other and pressure each other into doing things that, that we want each other to do, we just love people as they are. Rather than trying to force agreement when we're talking with each other, we don't use the words want or things like this, but instead, you know, we would like to invite you to come to the movies or would you be interested to come to the movies? Uh, are you interested in seeing this new movie? Is this something that you would like to do, right? And then if they say yes, oh great, you can come with us. No, okay, well enjoy whatever it is that you do, right? You just accept what someone is choosing to do, but by communicating with a purpose, where you're not trying to force or control someone's decisions and you're not just saying, you know, where are you? What are you doing? I miss you. Then you'll be able to remove attachment out of your relationships. As part of the Eightfold Path, the Buddha provides this perfect plan to be able to train the mind to get to enlightenment. Through your wise decision making of understanding the Eightfold Path, you might understand that breathing mindfulness meditation and generosity are the two generalized trainings that the Buddha taught in order to eliminate craving, desire, attachment. When you're focused on the breath and the mind moves off the breath and you cut that off and let it go and come back, 
what you're not doing is you're not trying to eliminate thoughts. Instead, what you're doing is you're gaining control or discipline of the mind that whenever the mind moves off the breath, you can easily cut that off, let it go and come back to the breath. And you might do that 20 times, 50 times, 100 times in one meditation session. And now two to three meditation sessions a day over a consistent long-term period of time, you're gradually training the mind to easily let go and be able to come back. So you're gaining this control and discipline of the mind. So that in daily life, where you see the mind longing and yearning, wanting things to be a certain way, you can easily cut that off and let it go and bring the mind back. But if you don't do this breathing mindfulness meditation on a consistent long-term basis for two to three meditations a day, you're not gonna have that control. So in a relationship where you see your mind longing and yearning, Mom, please come to the movies with us. Oh, that's a craving. If you observe that as a craving and you've trained your mind in breathing mindfulness meditation, you can cut that off and be like, you know what? You just stay here if that's what you'd like to do. Enjoy your time, right? Because as long as you keep craving and craving and craving and trying to pressure mom to come to the movies, for example, this is going to strain the relationship. But if you've trained your mind in breathing mindfulness meditation, you will be able to observe when the mind is pulling towards the objects of its affection, wanting things to be a certain way in the relationship, and then you'll have the control and the discipline to cut that off and let it go, and then just move on. And that can be very liberating for the mind. You would need to do a certain amount of breathing mindfulness meditation in order to eliminate attachments in your relationship. Without that, you're not gonna be able to actually eliminate attachments. So the breathing mindfulness meditation is the primary form of meditation that the Buddha taught because it addresses the primary problem in the mind that is causing discontentedness, which is the craving desire attachment. And then that practice of generosity is so very important, the giving and sharing. What generosity is, is the giving and sharing of more than is strictly required of your time, your effort, your energy, and your resources. This is where you're freely willing to give your time, effort, energy, and resources to help other people. And of course, you need to do this from the middle way, right? You can't just crave to practice generosity because that's not going to be helpful. But also, if you never practice generosity, that's not going to be helpful either. So when you're in the middle and you're practicing generosity where you're giving and sharing, now the mind is being trained to let go rather than to hold on to things. Because when the mind has craving, desire, attachment, it's oftentimes very selfish. And as long as the mind is selfish and holding on to things tightly, then in your relationships, there's going to be this uh, discontentedness because of the craving, desire, attachments. So this generalized training of breathing mindfulness meditation and generosity that is helping to eliminate all cravings, desire, attachments, it's also helping you in your relationships to eliminate the craving, desire, attachments in your relationships as well. So you're gaining this control over the mind and you're easily able to let things go then if you do that enough, eventually you'll get the mind liberated where there'll be no more craving, desire, attachments in the mind and you'll only be experiencing peacefulness and joy. Understand that as you're going forward in your relationships, that if you're walking together in life and people in your home, for example, are all practicing the teachings of the Buddha, you'll create a much more harmonious environment. You're Enlightenment isn't dependent on whether other people are practicing these teachings, but where possible, if other people are practicing the teachings, it will be much more straightforward for you to be able to move forward as a, as a group and as individuals while everybody's practicing the teachings. So if there's a husband and a wife or two wives or two husbands and children and other people in the household together and everybody's practicing these teachings, then you can be encouraging, supporting and uplifting of each other as you're 
moving forward together in your own independent journey, but everybody's wisdom is getting more and more developed where you might be able to encourage, support, and motivate and help each other along the path. Where you see your child having an attachment, or you see your wife or your husband having an attachment, or you see your grandchildren or your uh, siblings or people like this having attachment, you'll be able to help them with that. And then the relationships that are closest to you, if everybody's understanding that the discontentedness is being caused by their own mind and everybody's working to eliminate their own craving, desire, attachments, this will bring everybody into harmony more readily. It's more challenging when that's not occurring, but it's not impossible. You can actually still get to enlightenment without anybody else in your life actually practicing these teachings. But it just is more helpful if you have this kind of thing going on. In situations where you might be sleeping with people, there's a certain form of attachment that's actually happening. The mind is forming this attachment where when you're sleeping with somebody regularly on a consistent ongoing basis, you might have observed that when that person isn't there, it's challenging for you to fall asleep or you don't sleep as well when they're not there. And that's because the mind is attached. It's not because of love. Love doesn't cause the mind to not sleep well. Instead, it's this attachment that the mind is now dependent on this person sleeping next to you. And when they sleep with you, then the mind is content or it feels content, at least in that moment. And it feels like you can get a good night's sleep. So where you're observing that you might be sleeping with somebody regularly and this is an ongoing thing, what you would like to do is sometimes sleep alone. Create some impermanence in the situation where sometimes you guys sleep together, sometimes you guys sleep alone. And this is going to be helpful for the mind to let go so that there's not attachment in the relationship. When you're sleeping side by side with someone on an ongoing basis, there's going to be attachment that's going to get formed in the relationship. And this is just going to sabotage your relationships and cause challenges and difficulties. So while some people might look at it like, okay, husband and wife or two husbands or two wives that are choosing to sleep uh, in different rooms or different places, and I think, well, what's wrong with you? Is there, are you guys angry at each other, right? We say that if, you know, one person's sleeping on the couch, you know, are you in the doghouse? Did you do something wrong, right? Well, learn to understand that you can sleep separately without anything being wrong. Everything can be perfectly right in the relationship, but you're just choosing to sleep separately in order to train the mind to not have attachment. Whereas if you're always sleeping together and you're always sleeping together for months and years and years, the mind's going to get attached. And eventually this is going to be impermanent. One of you guys are going to die first or one of you guys are going to be sick in the hospital for a long term period of time. The other these two people are going to then have difficulty sleeping and they're going to have challenges because they're now apart from each other. So rather than allow that to occur and then struggle through that experience when somebody maybe dies or someone's in the hospital or someone's on a business trip or something like this, instead, when you guys are in the home together, choose, you know, consciously choose to sleep separately sometimes. And you might be uh, have a, having a hard time to sleep when you're doing that. But that doesn't mean come back together and sleep together because you're not going to get over the difficulty of being apart and not sleeping with each other by choosing to run back together and sleep together. So if you choose to sleep alone and you find that very difficult and very challenging, then you should do it again and again and again until you can train the mind to be peaceful and joyful, not sleeping together. And that's where the mind then becomes more liberated. And then when you're able to do that in terms of sleeping, now you'll be able to, in your relationships, when you're talking or when you're eating or you're spending time together, there'll be less and less attachment in your relationships because you've eliminated this attachment to sleeping together that you can be content and joyful and peaceful sleeping together. You can be peaceful and joyful sleeping apart. Now the mind has one less thing that it's craving permanence in this relationship. So this is really helpful for the mind to train it to be able to sleep alone.
When there's no attachment in a relationship, the relationship can actually be a lot more close. Oftentimes we think that when we misunderstand love and we think that craving, desire, attachment is love, we think that when we get rid of craving, desire, attachment, that there's no more love in the relationship. But in reality, what you'll find is that when there is no craving, desire, attachment in the relationship, you'll be completely peaceful and joyful. You guys will never be angry at each other. You'll never be sad. You'll never be missing each other. You'll never be frustrated or irritated with each other. You'll never be annoyed. But as long as you keep allowing attachment to persist, then there's going to be discontentedness in the relationship. Sometimes in some cultures, what we're taught is that <clears throat> a family that eats together stays together, right? And this is the mind craving permanence, that as a family, we have to always eat together. And if we always eat together, that means that we're always going to stay together. This is actually untrue. If the mind is trying to force the family to always eat together, there's going to be some situations where you can do that and some situations where you can't. And if you're basing your closeness as a family on whether you eat together or not, then that means when you eat together, you're going to feel close. And when you don't eat together, you're going to feel lonely. You're going to feel bored. You're going to feel like the family isn't very close. But that, once again, is craving, desire, attachment. It's not possible for all the members of the household to always eat together. Sometimes you're going to be able to eat together. Sometimes you're not. A family that doesn't have attachment this is going to bring closeness in the relationship because now the members of the family aren't trying to force each other to do things any particular way that instead you can be peaceful and joyful no matter what. If we eat together, peaceful and joyful. If we don't eat together, peaceful and joyful. But if you can only be happy when everybody's together, then when people are apart, you're going to feel miserable. And this is because of craving, desire, attachment. So what you hear in society and what a common individual is going to be talking about, things like a family that eats together stays together, this is due to the unknowing of true reality. This is because people's minds don't understand craving, desire, attachment. And if you keep conforming to what other people are talking about and what other people choose to do, then you're never going to be able to rise above what everybody else is choosing to do in order to get to that peacefulness, in order to get to that joy. Because as long as you keep conforming to what everybody in society is doing, then you're just going to stay in discontentedness with everybody else. As I've talked in other classes about this lotus flower that moves up through the murky water of the pond, ascends over the murky water, and then blooms into a lotus flower. And this is a symbol of enlightenment. That murky water is the world and conforming to the world. So you can't bloom as a lotus flower when you're down in the murky water. You need to ascend over and above the murky water in order to bloom like a lotus flower. So when you hear things like this that you might have just be kind of normal at this point based on your culture, based on your upbringing, based on things that you've heard, Things like a family that eats together stays together. If that's what you truly believe and that's what your mind thinks and you keep conforming to that, then that's just the mind craving permanence and you're not going to be able to move through this murky water and bloom like a lotus flower. So you're going to need to let things go like that and realize that this is just an attachment. And that when you eliminate attachment in your relationships, you'll see that there'll be a closeness that you probably never thought possible. Because when you experience discontentedness in relationships, this means there's an attachment. If you're experiencing anger, frustration, irritation, annoyance, guilt, shame, fear, boredom, loneliness, that you're missing this person, jealousy, resentment, You've got craving, desire, attachment in the mind, and now this is going to sabotage the relationship. So when you're experiencing discontentedness that the whole family's not together to eat, that's because of your craving, desire, attachment. You need to let that go. That's craving permanence. It's not possible for everyone to permanently eat together. And there's other things like this that you're going to observe in your relationships that when things are a certain way, your mind might be happy. But then when you don't experience those things, the mind might be sad or angry. 
there you can look in and you can see, ah, there's some craving. The mind's wanting things to be a certain way. And as long as it gets that, then it's getting these pleasant feelings. And when it doesn't get that, it's getting these painful feelings. So you're going to need to train the mind to overcome that through eliminating the craving, desire, attachment. And one of the things to think about along these lines is look at quality time versus quantity of time. Oftentimes, people might look at the quantity of time thinking that that's what one might aspire for. But what you should look at is the quality of the time you're spending together. So if you're only spending one hour a week with your children or your grandchildren or your partner or something like that, if it's quality time, that's what's important. If you're spending 20 hours a week with your life partner, but both of you guys are arguing, you're frustrated, you're looking at the phone, you're not really spending quality time together, who cares that it's 20 hours a week that you're spending with your partner or your children or somebody else? Instead, really value and treasure that one or two or three or four hours, however many hours it is, and ensure that it's quality time because that's what's going to produce the best results in your relationships. And then remember to have patience. Because as you're learning these topics and you're putting these teachings of the Buddha into practice, it's going to take gradual training, gradual practice in order to experience gradual progress. You can't just snap your fingers and instantly eliminate attachment in your relationships. You're going to struggle. You're going to have mistakes. Your family members are going to do things that maybe they regret or maybe you're going to do things that you regret. And this is part of the learning process. It's part of the struggle. So you're going to need to have patience with yourself and realize that in some situations, you're going to be able to learn teachings, implement them, practice them well, and you'll see the results of that. But in other situations, it's going to be a lot harder. It's going to be a lot more challenging, particularly relationships where there's a lot of craving. You're going to experience more challenges with right intention, right speech, right action, and this discontentedness arising. So be patient with it and realize that you need to accumulate a certain amount of benefits. So if you've been meditating for three months or six months or nine months or a year, it would be unwise to expect that you're already going to be enlightened with such a short period of time. Remember, the Buddha took six years to actually get to enlightenment. So it's going to take some time. So it's going to need some patience on your part to realize that you're a work in progress. And the people around you are a work in progress too. And everybody's at a different place in their journey. Not that you need to judge where one person is or another person is. Just focus on your own practice, but have patience with yourself and have patience with others too. An enlightened being is going to be very patient. They're not going to be impatient. So where you're noticing that the mind is impatient, you're going to need to arise this patience because patience is a virtue. Good things come to those who wait. You're going to need to learn to be patient and gradually work towards the goal rather than what the unenlightened mind is used to, which is pursuing things out of craving. Craving, craving, craving. Give me, give me, give me. I want it now. I want it now. Give it to me now. Give it to me now. I want those pleasant feelings. That's part of the problem, that impatience, the chasing after the objects of your affection. So when you cultivate patience in the mind, then you can practice this middle way where the mind isn't chasing after the objects of its affection. It can be content in the present moment. It can be peaceful and joyful in the present moment. So as long as the mind is impatient, you're not going to be able to experience liberation. You're going to need to arise a certain amount of patience with yourself and with those people around you as well. And then lastly, the thing that will ultimately help you eliminate attachment in your relationships is doing what I call reflecting on death. One of the most challenging things for a human being to experience and consider and think about is death. Your own death and the death of the people that are closest to you. The way that you might think is with a life partner or with children or grandchildren or friends or family, brothers, sisters, mom, dad, things like this. You might think in your mind, I just can't go on if I don't have this person, right? Boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, whatever it is. I wouldn't be able to go on in life without this person. 
And this is because of the craving desire attachment. And in way, a way to overcome this is to train the mind to reflect on death, your own death and the people around you. You're not wishing that you die. You're not aspiring for other people to die. But instead, what you do is you sit quietly, perhaps close the eyes all by yourself, and you envision that you've died and or you've envisioned that other people have died that are closest to you. And it's like you're a fly on the wall at your own funeral or that you're kind of envisioning going through the process of getting notified that somebody close to you has died. Maybe a police officer, a doctor, a nurse, somebody at the hospital, maybe a government official is coming to inform you that this person that's close to you has died. And you would like to convince the mind that this has really occurred. And now you walk through over 10, 15, 20 minutes envisioning that this person has indeed died and envision what you would do. You're not planning this and you're not sticking to whatever you envision, but you're just confronting death because what the mind wants to do in the unenlightened state is it wants to avoid this whole topic of death. It doesn't even want to think about it because the mind can't envision going on without this person. But as long as you stay stuck in that situation, when death occurs, it's going to feel like somebody's chopping you off at the knees, either your death or the death of somebody close to you. It's going to feel like someone's pulled the carpet out from under your feet. And then essentially what's happened is death has snuck up on you. And now, boom, you're having to confront it, you know, based when death occurs. But if you confront it on your terms, now you can train the mind to be more comfortable and more accepting of death, realizing that it's going to occur. Nobody is going to be able to eliminate death. We are all required to die. And the relationships around us, they're all impermanent. There's no way for any of the relationships that we experience to be permanent. And there's no way for anybody who's listening to this right now to be permanent. You are going to die. And it's not God that's choosing for you to die if you have a belief in God. Instead, the only reason why you're dying is because you were born. The only reason why the people around you die is because they were born. They're impermanent. Everything that arises, it's going to change and it's going to fade away. So if you allow death to sneak up on you, then you're going to need to confront it and you're going to feel like someone's pulled out the carpet from under you or they've chopped you off at the knees. But by you sitting and reflecting on death and thinking about as if, you're, have, as if you have died and you're now a fly on the wall, observing your funeral and everything that's happening after that, or you can convince the mind that you've actually gotten notified that your people close to you have died and now you envision what it's like to move on. When you do this, you might feel discontent. You might be sad. You might be angry. You might get frustrated during this time. This is completely normal. You'll observe that this discontentedness will arise. And then over the next week or two or three, when you observe that the discontentedness is not there any longer, then do this again, and you'll see that the discontentedness will diminish a bit. And then after a week, two or three or four, do it again and keep doing it until you can do this exercise of reflecting on your own death and the death of other people that are closest to you. And the mind is completely content and it understands that this is normal. And as you're doing this reflection, you might observe that if grandma truly died or mom truly died or husband or wife truly died, there are certain things that you haven't said to them that you wish you would have said, or there are certain questions you might have for them that you wish you would have asked them. And if you observe that through your reflection, the beauty about this activity is that you can pick up the phone or you can go see that person and you can tell them the things that you realize that you need to tell them or you can ask them certain questions that you need to ask them. Whereas if you allow death to sneak up on you, then once they actually die, you don't have that opportunity. You can't tell them things because they're already dead and you can't ask them questions because they're already dead. But if you confront death on your terms over multiple sessions, then it's like getting bonus time. I did this about 25 years ago with my mom and my 
grandmother. And I realized that there were certain things that I hadn't said to them. And there are certain things that I needed to ask them that I hadn't asked them. And I did this over multiple sessions. In each session, the mind was discontent, but it got less and less and less to the point where it wasn't discontent any longer. But I was able to call them up and talk to them and say, you know, grandma, I've always been meaning to tell you this. Or, you know, mom, I've been meaning to ask you this. I would like to ask you this question. And each time I emerged out of these sessions, I was able to do that. And then for the next 20, 25 years, every time I spoke with them and every time I spent time with them, I felt like it was bonus time because I'd already convinced my mind that they had died. And then when I spent time with them or I talked to them, it felt like bonus time. And then ultimately when my mom died in 2017, I didn't have any grief at all whatsoever. And my grandmother is still alive and I know when she dies that I won't have any grief when she dies either because I've already accepted her death and I realize she's impermanent. But when I was 16 years old and my very first girlfriend died, Oh, I was devastated because I didn't understand impermanence and I didn't understand attachment in relationships. So for two or three years, I was in a deep, deep depression as a result of this death. And then in my early 20s, about 20 years old, my grandfather died, who I was very close to. And in that situation, I also didn't understand impermanence and attachment. I grieved for about three months with his death. But then later in life, my stepfather died and I didn't have any grief in that uh, death with that death at all. And then in 2017, when my mom died, I didn't have any grief with her either. And I know when my grandmother dies, I won't have any grief with that either because it's not the love that's causing the grief. It's the craving, desire, attachment, wanting this being to be permanent. So if you can eliminate that from the mind through all the things that I've been sharing, including this, to reflect on the death of the people that are closest to you, and then you'll get comfortable with death and you can envision yourself moving on beyond this person's death, where if you stay stuck in, I can't imagine living without this person, then you're stuck. And that means when they die or when you're getting ready to die, it's going to be really, really painful. So whether it's your children, your grandchildren, your children, uh, uh, your nieces, your nephews, your husbands, your wives, your parents, people like this, all of these people who are close to you that you know your mind is holding on to, one by one, you might consider reflecting on their death. And you may even choose to start with your own death because this is a fear that many people oftentimes have. And by doing this activity, you'll see that you'll be able to gain this comfort and this peacefulness, understanding your own death, that it's going to occur. You can't avoid it in any way. And the people around you, they're going to die also. You can't avoid this. It's absolutely going to occur. So these are the things that I had to share with you today. I'll just open up to any questions that you guys might have for the rest of the class. You can put that into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, or you can raise your hand in Zoom and ask any questions that you like. Yes, teacher David. The same has his hand raised. Let's go to him. Well, on Facebook, I mean, all right, sir, is there a difference between missing someone and thinking of someone and reaching out? I have many friends who live in another country, and every few months I may take a photo of nature and text it to a few people with a note that I would like to share this scene of beauty without expectations of a response. I don't feel that I miss these people necessarily, but would like to keep our connection because of the love we share as friends. Is that an attachment? It all depends. What you're describing doesn't sound like an attachment, but you're going to need to test the mind in order to observe whether it is an attachment or not. If the mind is missing somebody, there's definitely, excuse me, there's definitely a craving, desire, attachment there in the mind. But if what it is that you're describing that you're just interested in maintaining a relationship uh, and you might choose to share something with them, perhaps there's not an attachment there. But this is how you test the mind to determine if there is an attachment or not. 
in the situation where you don't feel like you're missing the person, but you would just like to take a picture of the scenery and send it to them, go ahead and take the picture, but don't send it to them. Wait a week or two and see how the mind feels about that. If your mind is like, oh, I really want to send this picture. I really want to send this picture. And you feel a craving in there that the mind really wants to send it. Then there's a there's a craving desire attachment there. But if there's no craving desire attachment there, you should be able to take this picture and sit on it for a week or two or three. If you send it now or you send it a week, two or three from now, it shouldn't matter. But if there's a craving desire attachment there, the mind's going to keep thinking about it and wanting to send this photo to this person over and over and over and over again. So the next time you have that feeling or that thought or that inspiration or that aspiration to do that, go ahead and take the picture, hold on to it for a while, see how the mind uh, experiences that and observe, is there any kind of longing or yearning to send this? And if you observe after a few weeks that there isn't one, then wonderful, then you know that. So the way that you ultimately determine whether there's craving, desire, attachments or not, is that you put the mind in a situation where if there is a craving, it will experience discontentedness. And the discontentedness shows you that there is a craving desire attachment there. And by you elongating the amount of time that you potentially send that photo, if there's discontentedness there, you keep elongating it and not allowing the mind to send the photo until you observe that there's no discontentedness in the mind whatsoever. And then that's where you know, okay, the mind has potentially let this go. Now let me send the photo. So put the mind in that situation and observe it to see if there's any discontentedness arising. Then you'll know for sure whether it's an attachment or not. Well, no more questions on Facebook. Teacher David, um, if we have people around us that expect us to get in touch with them on a regular basis as a proof that we care about them, and uh, for example, sometimes I feel obligated to send a text message or something just to say a hey, hi, because I know they expected that uh, from me. And uh, I mean, I want to have those people in my life. And I know that it means a lot to them, even though I, I'm, I don't feel the need to do that. So um, should I do that? How to look at that? Because I'm trying to kind of uh, do it just because I know it means a lot to them. So I don't know if it's attachment, if it's uh, trying to please someone, or it's simply just uh, a way to say, uh, in a way it may be even be a generosity, meaning, okay, I know this means a lot to you, so I'll do that. So I'm not very clear what is attachment, what is um, trying to please someone, what is, uh, so how to look at that, please? Sure. So what your mind has done in this situation is you've taken this expectation from the other person, which that's a craving desire attachment, and you've now adopted it as your own craving desire attachment. When you're trying to please someone, this is you trying to feed a craving desire attachment and expectation of someone else, and they can only be pleased, they can only have that pleasant feeling if they get this message from you. So now you've adopted their craving, desire, attachment, and their expectation. And this isn't advisable because you're trying to get rid of your own craving, desires, attachments. The last thing you're interested in doing is, is adopting somebody else's. So what you're gonna need to do in this situation is you're gonna potentially need to help them understand that your love and your relationship isn't contingent upon whether you send this message or not because you're adopting their craving desire attachment and you've still got a craving desire attachment because you don't feel content and joyful if you don't send this message so if you don't send the message and you just don't send it their mind's going to get discontent and then maybe you're discontent because they're discontent and this is your attachment to them. So what you might choose to do is you might choose to explain to them, help them understand true love. And oftentimes the ways that you can do this is through asking a question. You can ask them, you can say, you know, I know that you really appreciate me sending a text message to you, but if I didn't send a text message to you for like a month or two, 
Does that mean that I don't love you anymore? Does that mean to you that I'm not interested in a relationship with you? And if they say, yes, that means that you don't want to be my friend anymore. Then you're going to have to help them see that that's not true because that's their craving, desire, attachment. That's their condition. They think that you can only be friends or you can only be a loved one if you send me this message. And they're not understanding craving, desire, attachment. They're not understanding conditional love or conditional relationship. So you might need to help them get some education so that you can get liberated from your own craving and no longer feeling obligated to then send this message to them. Because if you keep doing that, then your mind's still attached. You're still craving. You're still wanting to send them a message. And that's the way that you think that this is required in order to have a relationship with this person. So you would like to get to a point where your mind is peaceful and joyful, whether you send them a message or not. And it would be wonderful if their mind was that way too, uh, but their mind may or may not be interested in doing the work to understand that. So as long as your mind is continuing to do this, it's not liberated. It still has a craving, desire, attachment. Thank you, teacher David. Mm -hmm. uh, looks like that we don't have any other questions at this time. Okay. Well, I would like to thank all of you for joining in today's class. Uh, in our future class next Sunday, we're going to be discussing the next part of this retreat series titled Harmony and Relationships. The class is titled Training the Mind to Acquire Concentration, Developing Singleness of Mind in a Distracting World. Because the world can be very distracting with all this craving, desire, attachment from everybody else and all these electronic devices and jump, jumping around from place to place to place. It can be very much a struggle to be able to practice singleness of mind when things in the world are kind of designed to grab your attention. Well, as long as your mind isn't able to practice singleness of mind and the mind is bouncing around, lacking concentration, you're going to find it very challenging in relationships to be able to be focused and concentrated and have quality time like we talked about today. So I'm going to teach you how to cultivate singleness of mind and develop this concentration so that now in all your relationships, you can practice having focus and concentration, clarity of mind and deep memory. And this will enhance your relationships as you're able to practice that. And then this Wednesday, we're going to be doing breathing mindfulness meditation as a group together. So you guys are welcome to join for that. So thank you all for joining in today's class. We'll see you in one of these future classes, perhaps. Have a very lovely and wonderful rest of your day. Sawadee Thank you again for watching. Enjoy your meditation. Look forward to seeing you online and answering any questions that you might have. Thank you so much.